husband, Phil, and I have the awesome opportunity of overseeing the young adult ministry here. Yeah. Um, we love it so much and um, just love living life with them. So we are in um, the second week of a series in Acts. It's a 12-week series. Jim kicked us off last week. And if you've read the book of Acts, you know it is a fast-moving book. It is just about the church being empowered by the Holy Spirit to be witnesses to Jesus to the ends of the earth. That's the theme of Acts. There's a lot going on in there, but the main idea is the church is on mission to witness to the goodness and grace of Jesus and the power of his resurrection. And we're invited to join in. The church through the ages has been called to be missional. And God is calling Lake Highlands Church to be missional. And we have um, a tool right now that we're doing um, that Donjali mentioned this morning called Revive that we're doing in our life groups. We're just praying the prayers of Acts and asking God to empower us for the Holy Spirit to come fresh and empower us to be missional people. So that's what Revive is about. Um, So yeah, in chapters three through five, where we are today, we're gonna learn that a missional church is generous, a missional church is bold, and a missional church is authentic. So pray with me and we'll um, dig into the word together. Does that sound good? All right, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for giving us the scriptures. (laughs) Thank you for um, just revealing more of who, of your heart, of who Jesus is, um, of life in the Holy Spirit through this book of Acts. Would you open our hearts this morning, God? I'm just really aware that we all come in here with, with a lot, a lot of busyness, a lot of hurts, a lot of distractions, and to just Quiet us, God. Would you quiet us? Just even right now, would you come, Holy Spirit, and open our hearts and our minds to receive from you? Would you open your word to us, Lord, whether we've read it a zillion times or never? Would you speak a fresh word to us this morning through these chapters and acts? We love you, Lord. Amen. Well, One of the things that, um, that we know about a missional church is that they're generous, and we see this right off the bat. Um, the early church meets together, they share all their belongings, and um, in chapter three, we pick up, the first story is Peter and John one day, they're going to the temple to pray. And on their way to the temple, they get to the temple gate, there's a lot of people gathering there, and they get to the temple gate, and they see this guy that's a beggar. And he's sitting there, and he's, you know, waiting for people to come by. And he says to Peter and John, do you have any money to give me? And Peter looks at him and says in Acts 3, verse 5, he looks at him and he says, "Um, I don't have any money. I don't have any silver or gold. But what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, walk. And I I really love that he says, what I have, I give you. And I don't know about you, but you might think like, well, I've tried talking to people that are begging for money, and that never happens. People don't get up and walk. And so it's really easy to just focus on the dramatic in this story, because Peter has a killer gift of healing, right? Right? I mean, there's another place in Acts that it says that people would bring the lame and the sick and just his shadow would fall on them and they would be healed. So it's really easy to focus on that and miss what Peter is really saying. He says, what I have, I give you. Because church, we can only give what God's given us, right? So what has he given us? Has he given you the gift of healing? Awesome. But has he given you the gift of compassion? or time, or mercy, we just use what God gives us. We give away. That's a core value of the early church. They gave away what God gives them. And when we try to do it differently and just kind of try to muster it up, it's empty and hollow, and it'll burn us out. So what has God given you? It's really easy to compare ourselves to Peter and say, I can't do what Peter did. And maybe you can't, but you can do something because God's poured out his spirit on the church. 
And we tend to compare ourselves. Even as a church, we tend to compare ourselves to other churches. So what has God given us individually and what has he given us as a church? What does Lake Highlands Church have to give away? That's all God's really asking us to do. Well, Peter, um, this healing takes place um, in front of a lot of people. So it brings a lot of attention and um, that tends to get them in trouble. But, well, first of all, let me just go back a second and just say that we don't have to feel pitiful about what we don't have. Does anyone feel pitiful about what they don't have, about what they can't do? Are y'all really aware of your weaknesses and your limitations? I just want you to think for a second, what has God given you? Has he given you anything? Yeah, take a deep breath, Gwen. That's right. He's given us something. We don't have to feel pitiful about what we don't have. We just use what he's given us. And I love... um, My friend, Robbie Hare, one of the young adults in our church, um, he is experiencing this joy of giving away what God has given him. And he's a teacher, a fourth and fifth grade teacher. And in the fall, he got to go to a conference in New York City. And at that conference, God really got a hold of his heart and kind of started shifting his heart in a way that has really um, caused him to live his life differently. He got to hear Tony Evans speak, a pastor in Dallas, and Tony was talking about God being a father to the fatherless. And when Tony starts talking about that, you may know that that's one of God's promises, but when Tony was talking about it, he's like, so how does God do that? How do, have y'all ever thought about that? Like, how does God do that? He uses his people. He just uses his people. And so Robbie started, um, he said that, God just kept putting that on his mind over and over and over again. And so he just started praying about that. What does that mean? And it has shifted Robbie's perspective from seeing himself as a teacher, an educator only, to really being a spiritual father to his students. There's been a shifting in his purpose. And that's, that makes like whatever your job is a little bit more meaningful, doesn't it? When you sense that you're, you have a purpose, that you're on mission with God, And he said that one day he was walking down the hall and there was a student, not one of his, another student, sitting in the hall crying. And this is what Robbie said. He said, I couldn't walk by that student because a father, a good father, doesn't walk by a kid that's crying. And so it was his lunch hour. And instead of, you know, if you're a teacher or know anything about teachers, like, that's precious time. (laughs) And instead, Robbie sat down on the floor and talked to this kid. And this kid had just recently lost a grandparent. Um, His sister had a lot of medical needs. He wasn't getting very much attention at home. And he had just gotten switched out of a class. And it was kind of, it was really devastating to his little third grade mind because he couldn't see his best friend, you know, just, and Robbie just took time to spend time with him and hang out with him. And you know what? It's caused him to know, it's caused Robbie to know the heart of God more. He said it was a really affirming moment for him, like, God wants to use me. He just gave away what God had given him, time, which is really precious to a teacher, and a heart that has been changed by God. So give, we just give, we just give what we've been given. Missional people give away what God has given them. Their generosity was so radical. It it says in Acts that no one had a need. In Acts um, 4, 32 through 35, we see that a missional church is radically generous. Um, All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had, and with great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus And God's grace, my favorite line, God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet and it was distributed to anyone who had need. God's grace was so powerfully at work among them that this was their response. 
I love it so much because I think it's easy in the American church culture to think of grace in the negative. For example, we think like, well, because of grace, I'm not condemned, which is really good news, right? But it's in the negative. We think of we don't have to live by laws or rules. Awesome also, but that's also in the negative. We think about I don't have to feel guilty about my sin because, you know, there's grace for that. But we forget that God's grace empowers us to live godly lives. God's grace has come, it says in in Titus 2, to empower us to live the lives he's always intended for us to live. And that is to be his image bearers, to look like Jesus. And so it was God's grace so powerfully at work, not guilt or you know, someone forcing you, or it, but his grace powerfully at work. God is empowering us to live like he's always intended us to live as his children. It's a higher view of grace, y'all, than we sometimes grab onto in the church. It's really, really good news. So Jesus gives us the grace to live fully as God's children. And that may mean selling your possessions and giving to the poor. It's what Jesus told us to do, right? Sell our possessions and give to the poor. And he gives, gave the grace to the New Testament church, the early church, and he gives the grace to us to live that out. So the New Testament church or the early church or a missional church, a missional people, us, we're generous. And we're also, missional people are also bold. Back to that beggar that got healed. Remember this, Peter and John are going up to the temple to pray. It's the hour of prayer. There's a lot of traffic. They get to the gate, you know, where this beggar is asking for help. He gets healed. And you know, that's a pretty big deal. Like someone's completely lame and it's a big deal to the guy that gets healed. And his reaction stirs a lot of attention. He uh, jumps up, leaping, praising, dancing, you know, making a scene. Well, this crowd gathers, right? This is pretty dramatic. So this crowd gathers. And so what does Peter do? He takes the opportunity to preach about Jesus. And the message of the preaching that Peter does is this, this man, Jesus, whom you crucified, He actually calls him the author of life. He says to the crowd, you killed him. You killed the author of life. Now, that might not be the way you want to share Jesus in your high school or in your workplace, but Jesus, Peter knows his audience, right? Many of those people were at the crucifixion. You killed the author of life, and that's all of mankind. We put Jesus on the cross. And he says, but God has raised him from the dead. Well, this boldness doesn't go over very well. Sometimes we think, like, if I just do it God's way, it'll go good, right? Yeah. So this boldness doesn't go over very well, and the, the leaders and the rulers come and arrest him and John and um, put them in jail. And I love, I love that what their response is, is to not, um, well, let's look at Acts 4.29. Missional people pray for boldness when they get in trouble. And in Acts 4.29, they come back to this house, and it's not just Peter and John that are praying for boldness. It says all of the church, like all of the people gathered together, are praying for boldness. It's not just preachers that need boldness. The whole church needs boldness, y'all. And this is what they pray in Acts 4.29. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. I don't know about you, but I would probably want to pray, consider their threats and make them stop. Or consider their threats and protect me. But that's not what they pray. Consider the threats and give us more boldness. And he does. The Holy Spirit falls. The room that they're meeting in is shaken, and he gives them more boldness. But again, it's so easy to compare, right? Like, you're like, well, I can't preach the gospel like Peter, me neither. You know, that's not the point. How does God want each of us to be bold? How does he want us to be bold in our church? Um, Another uh, young adult in our church, Mallory Nishan, um, uh, is a bold woman. You might look at her and think she's 
this gentle and quiet person, because she is that too. I think sometimes we associate boldness with brashness or with loudness, but boldness is just love in action. And it flows out of knowing Jesus. If you love Jesus and you know him, you can't help but act and tell people about him or do what he tells you to do. And so Mallory is one of these bold people who just is doing what God tells her to do. When she lived in Nashville, she was at a church and God put it on her heart to wanna be um, an overseas missionary. And um, he gave her opportunities to work with refugees. And she said one day she was in that church worshiping and she had a vision of veiled women worshiping Jesus. Isn't that awesome? And so she, um, she and her husband, Eric, um, moved to Dallas to get more equipping with PBT, a local um, missions organization. And um, they're, that's their dream, right? They're gonna, they're gonna go overseas and be missionaries. They're gonna come to Dallas and get equipped. And it felt so right and so clear to them. But they took an overseas trip to Turkey and um, just sensed that God became, began to close the doors. That's not, that's not what he had for them. You know, this journey that they're on. Sometimes we think it's this way and it's like this way. And, it, and Mallory's told me that um, she started feeling ashamed because, you know, this was what they were going to do. And all of a sudden, God's closing the doors. And so the shame came. The depression came. She said it was a really um, spiritual low point for her. But God hadn't closed the doors to her being a cross-cultural missionary. Um, he started giving her dreams about Turkey. She knew a few um, phrases, Turkish phrases. She would have dreams, and those Turkish phrases would be in her dreams. And um, her husband, Eric, found the Turkish Cultural Center in Richardson, really nearby, and they boldly stepped out and went and started taking Turkish classes. And then Mallory boldly started making friends with these women and having coffee with them, going to their homes, um, inviting them here to our church for fellowship. And at Christmas time, maybe you were one of the life groups that she set up some of these families to come and visit life groups. We got to host some in our young adult life group. And I asked Mallory before we hosted these Turkish friends, I said, would you just come and speak to the young adults about you know, give us some cultural awareness, um, help us to know your heart. And she said, well, I don't really like to speak in front of people, but if it will help, I will. So this gracious, kind, gentle-hearted woman is really bold. And so God's called us to be a missional people that are bold and um, step out of our comfort zone and share what he's given us. So a missional church is generous. A missional church is bold, and a missional church is authentic. In other words, missional people don't lie to God. So in chapter 5 of Acts, there's a disturbing little story. There are several stories, but there's this one disturbing story about these people named Ananias and Sapphira. And if you know the story um, of Ananias and Sapphira, um, we'll read it in just a second. Not yet. Um, but if you know this story about Ananias, will you take, yeah, thanks. If you know this story about Ananias and Sapphira, um, it's a story about how they sold some property. Remember, this church is selling property and giving their, their um, proceeds to the poor, right? So no one has a need. So if you know this story, Ananias and Sapphira sell some property. They appear to be giving the proceeds for the benefit of the church and the needy. But really what they do is they only give part of the proceeds and um, Peter calls that line to God and in the process of that, they die. And so it's a really easy story to just go like, I have no idea why that's there and I'm just gonna skip over it, which maybe is what I should have done this morning. Um, but I think, it's, I think we need to look at it because it's easy to just like skip over it and put it out of your mind or... Um, to get really frustrated with God. Like, how dare you, God? Like, why would you do that? It's, can I just say it's the only time something this severe happens in all of the New Testament. This is not God's ways. And even in the Old Testament, God is long-suffering, really long-suffering. Um, and I think, again, because of the drama of the story, 
it's easy to miss maybe some of the um, underlying points. So they come in pretending to sell, to give these proceeds. So let's look at this in Acts 5, 3 through 4. Um, Peter says, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. So do you hear what he's saying in there? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? In other words, no one forced you to sell the property. It was yours. No one actually even asked you to sell the property. It was your property. And then he says, and after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? In other words, freedom, y'all. God doesn't coerce us to partner in the kingdom with him. He gives us choices. We can choose to partner with him, but he doesn't coerce us to do it. It's never about the money. It was never about the money. It was about relationship. And you know, um, lying to God or to anyone you're in relationship with is exactly opposite of intimacy. We know this if you've ever experienced betrayal. You know by a friend or a spouse or a significant other, you know the sting of that. And the thought is, I thought I knew you, but I really don't. In line to God just breaks relationship. It just breaks relationship with him. This was all about intimacy and Ananias and Sapphira, the opposite of intimacy, pretending to be someone you're not. You bring the money, I don't know, you want to look good? You want to pretend to be something you're not. I don't know why it was so severe, the consequences. We don't get that excla explanation in the word. I don't know why it wasn't just a strong rebuke, but it was really severe. But what I do know is that I've heard from many of you stories of growing up in a church that seemed to have the emphasis all on outward appearance. It seemed to have to you, it seemed to have the emphasis on performance, outward appearance, kind of being someone that you weren't really, and it's absolutely deadly. It's deadly. And I, I think there's worse things than physical death, there's spiritual death. And for some people, it causes spiritual death to be in a church that is all about the outward. And perhaps, I don't know, maybe that's why um, this story, because this is the infancy of the church. This is the very beginning of the church. In Acts, this is the first time in this story that the word church is used. So what is God saying about the church? That he wants it to be authentic, maybe? That he doesn't want it to be about outward performance? That he doesn't want it to be about posing to be someone you're not? Because that's just, if you've lived like that, you know the death. You know the emptiness. And you know how it messes with your head and your view of God. I love that Michael Despain a couple weeks ago, like so boldly, shared his journey. And one of the things he said in there is his view of God was messed up. And man, when your view of God gets messed up because you think it's about performance or posing or appearance, that just leads to emptiness and decay and really the death of your spirit. And so whatever else Ananias and Sapphira is about, it's a huge no to pretending, a huge no to posing, performance, appearance, and it tells us just how deadly, literally for them, how deadly it is and has been for a lot of us. It turns off people from coming to the church too, doesn't it? Like, why do you wanna be part of pretending? And especially when in our culture we value authenticity above everything else sometimes. So all of this, being a church that is generous, 
bold and authentic has to flow out of knowing Jesus. Let's think about it for a minute. Let's think like you're going to be bold, like I'm going to be bold for Jesus, but you don't know him. That's just obnoxious. You know, you're just going to, I don't know what you're going to do, but you're just going to say some stuff, you know? But you, it's not really coming out of like the life that he's given you, the knowing him, the intimacy. Pretty soon, you might be able to do that for a while, but pretty soon that runs dry. What about being generous without knowing Jesus? You can do that out of legalism or self-righteousness, but pretty soon it causes bitterness in you because you start looking around, well, those people aren't giving. Well, what's wrong with those people? Or you feel really good about yourself because you are giving. If our generosity doesn't flow out of, man, Jesus, you're worth it. You're just so worth everything you've given me that I can give it away freely. It'll start corrupting you. And then authenticity, something our, we just love in our culture. Just don't want to be fake. Especially if you're, you know, we just talked about the posing and the faking. That tends to be an older generation thing. If you are in the younger generation, it's like, no way. No way am I going to pretend to be something I'm not. This is all about being authentic. But y'all, can I just say that being authentic without knowing Jesus can just turn into selfishness. Because an authentic relationship with Jesus will cause you to get outside your comfort zone and do things you don't feel like doing. But if you're just authentic for the sake of being authentic, it can just make you be like, well, I don't feel like doing that, so why bother? And that's just a form of selfishness. So we've got to have this, like, life of Jesus. That's what Acts is all about, like knowing Jesus. The Holy Spirit comes, empowers the church to know Jesus. So let's talk about just a few practicals here at the end about what does it mean to have intimacy with Jesus and how do we, how do, we do that? There's no formula in Christianity and there's no formulas in how to have intimacy with Jesus, but there are some tips, like in any relationships, right? In a marriage, it's good to have some tips. How do you, in friendships, it's good to have some tips. How do you, so here's some tips. No formulas, just tips. The first thing is to repent. Repent. Remember, repentance might sound like an intense word, but repentance just means turning back to God. So, right, like, God created us for him, so we walk toward him, we look at him, we look at him. And then, you know, we just get off. Right? And it might just be a little bit off, but a little bit off is dangerous because we don't recognize it. Sometimes we get a lot off, and we just start walking the other direction. And repentance just says, turn back to God. Just turn back. And it's the, do y'all know, it's the first words out of Jesus' mouth when he starts his ministry. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. It's like this beautiful invitation. In Acts 4, it says, repent, so times of refreshing will come. Repentance means, I know God. It's a really beautiful invitation. So repent. And then read about Jesus in the Gospels. Read about him in John 1. Man, the scriptures are one of God's greatest gift to us. And if you've gotten turned off or bored, I just encourage you to try it again. Read the Gospels. Read John 1 about Jesus being in the beginning with God and being actually God. Or Colossians 1. Jesus holds all things together. He created all things. It's amazing.